Well, hello everyone and welcome to another one of our fabulous classes on the book of Psalms. Um, we have been uh, studying Psalm 139. Uh, we put a pause in the middle of the Psalm last time. So this is going to be part two. There will be three parts to this study. So uh, fasten your seatbelts for this one. There's some very interesting things we're going to be uh, discovering today. So as we always do, Let's uh, just go to the Lord in prayer and lay down a foundation. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide our, our study this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you do, have done, and will do for us, Father. Now, you have been our blessing, our rock, our protection, our teacher, our guide, our creator, our sustainer. Lord, you are the God that makes and keeps promises. And we thank you, Father, for who you are. We thank you for your character. We thank you for creating us and bringing us into your creation, inviting us to participate with you. Father, we just ask as we uh, commit this time to you, this uh, next hour or so to you, we just ask the guidance of your Holy Spirit afresh in, in filling uh, that he would be opening to us this particular passage of scripture and helping us to understand what you have here for us. We just pray, Lord, that uh, this be honoring to you, that your truth is spoken and not man's philosophy. We thank you for all things, Father, in the precious name of your Son, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. So as we take a look at this, you can see that there's a number of interesting questions here. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit about uh, life after death and what that is all about. We're going to get into a number of um, of uh, elements, uh, still looking at his omniscience, his omnipresence, uh, and omnipotence. And so as we uh, look at this, um, I just want us to quickly um, get acquainted with what we looked at uh, last time. And we looked at the first couple of verses, 14 verses. This psalm was written by David. Um, it's to the chief musician, a psalm of David, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, lo, lo O Lord, you know it altogether. You have beset me behind and before and laid thine hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain to unto it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I free from your presence? If I ascend unto the heaven, you're there. And if I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous thy work are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So we said last time that Psalm 139 was penned by David to discuss three attributes of God his omniscience, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence. All three of these elements are found in this psalm. It's a, a theologically sound psalm, and yet it is so deep and so full of all sorts of little discoveries that we're really not doing it justice. We're really just looking at the surface. Omniscience means that God knows everything about everything, and he does this at all times, all the time. So he knows what we're going to think before we think it. That's the amazing thing. So we can't be thinking about one thing and then doing something else because God knows it. And so we, you know, sometimes we think we can maybe fool people, but we cannot fool God. He knows our, our thoughts before we even say them. Nothing that he doesn't understand about us. And the, the challenge is this. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. That's who our God is. On the presence, he's everywhere at every time and at all times, all the time. And I'll leave you to unpack that uh, if you uh, want to uh, study this particular uh, session of Psalm 139, because 
there's no place to escape God. He knows us. He knows us everything we're going to think. He knows what we're going to think three years from now if we're still mortal. If we're immortal, he knows what we're going to think three years from now. So all of these elements don't really change after we pass away. And so we're, we're going to be contemplating that a little bit towards the end of today. He's actively engaged in superintending every single aspect of our life, beginning from before we were born. That's the amazing thing. He knew us before the foundations of the world. Where, how old were the foundations of the world? Thousands of years at least. Well, he knew you intimately and knew everything about you before you were born. He's omnipotent. He has unlimited power total control over everything. He not only created all of creation, but he sustains all of creation. So with that thought in mind, last week we covered, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. And we talked about, about the elements um, of this. And we focused in, uh, when we left off last time, with the verse, I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. The fact is that he governs all of the cell division going on. When a fertilized egg, a single cell, sits in the mother's womb, it goes through a process called mitosis. And initially, all cells are identical. They divide, and then they divide again and again and again and again and again and again. And then all of a sudden, God says, okay, this next cell, instead of it being completely identical to the previous cell, this one's going to start forming a backbone. Oh, this one's going to start forming a toenail. Oh, this one's going to be a brain cell. And so God begins to work in that process. We are created marvelously. We cannot even fathom this, how he does this. He is involved in every single cell division. So his involvement with us in the womb was intimate and complex. So that's verse 14. Verse 15 says, my substance was not hid from thee. My substance. You see, one of the mistakes that we always make is we think we know what words mean until we actually look at them in the original, and then we go, oh, that's what it means. My substance was not hid from me when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Well, this verse has caused a lot of people a lot of anguish trying to figure out exactly what that means. Well, verse 15 continues the thought behind verse 14, and David extols the way that God made him, created him, formed him. The word substance is the Hebrew word atzim. It means strength or vigor or sturdiness of the human body. Well, you don't have a vigorous and sturdy human body when the child is in the womb. That's only after the young man or young woman begins to grow up and becomes more coordinated and all that. This is really looking, this is one of those statements that looks ahead into the future, and yet David is stating this as a past fact, and that's good for us to understand. So what, in, in essence, David's declaring that even when he was the size of a pea or less in his mother's womb, God saw into the future about how he would grow up, how rigorous, how rugged he was. He was able to prevail against wild animals as a shepherd, giants as a young lad, and armies as a king. And so God saw all of that. All of that was known to God. Now, it wasn't known to David. You see, we live in a dimension called time, and we can only live forward and look backwards. We can remember. But we can't do it the other way around. But God knows it all. It says that my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. The word secret is sether. It means hidden or private or covered or protected or hiding place. All of these are part of the concepts. It refers to the womb. The fact is that a woman, when she is with child, doesn't show. Now, she may see it quickly in herself, but anybody else looking at her with normal clothing on 
thinks that, you know, she's the same as she was. So in, in the East here, women wore normal clothing until their pregnancy became so uh, great that now they had to have some expanded clothing and they had to uh, to be able to uh, to uh, keep that covered place. So the covered place is talking about the womb and nobody sees it until the very end when it's popping out and then you go, oh, OK, there's a baby in there or else you really had a lot of pizza last night. So the point is God oversees everything as this child is growing. And this term wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. This is a Hebrew expression, a Hebraism, as if David was growing up in the womb far underground where nobody could see what was going on. Every cell was dividing trillions of times. Nobody saw that. Nobody saw all those cells dividing and this body beginning to form until we see like what it looks like in the picture there. Nobody saw that. We, when you look at verse 14, it says, marvelous thy works. How marvelous are God's works? This in and of itself is miraculous. Every life is a miracle. And we should never cease to wonder with awe and wonder at the creator God who set this all in motion. And then we get to verse 16. Verse 16 says, your eyes saw my substance, yet being unperfect. Always in the old, the, uh, old King James English, being perfect meant complete. So your eyes saw my substance, yet being incomplete. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Again, we're gonna look at this and struggle with the English and say, what is he saying? Well, it's pretty clear here, and I've given you sort of the, the Hebrew there for verse 16, so you can see it. This is a declarative statement from David that God knew David before his conception. Your eyes saw my substance yet being incomplete. Well, when are you incomplete? Well, the baby that's born next year right now is incomplete. Why? Because we've got more than the gestation period for a woman. So it's before that baby was even conceived. David says, God knew him. My substance yet being unperfect. You notice in the, in the inset box there that the Hebrew has one word. The root word is golem. It means to be wrapped up prior to being unfolded. It's exactly like what happens in the stages of an embryo. First, it looks like a pea, and then it begins to enlarge and enlarge and unfold. Then you get the head, the arms, and you know the feet and all that. And the baby essentially in, unfolds in that process. That's exactly what it's talking about. Now, this was written a thousand years before Jesus Christ, before the medical doctors had ever even seen a baby in the womb. There wasn't ultrasound. You couldn't go in and look at what's happening there. The Bible is full of these scientific statements that we just take for granted when we look at that. But God knows everything. Remember, he's omniscient. So all my members were written in the book. The book or Sefer is a written record that God records. He keeps a written record of every life before it's lived. Remember, God knows the end from the beginning. So he knows everything about your life, every detail, how it's going to go. Could this be the book of life that he's talking about? It's written in thy book. Uh, some people speculate that that could be the book of life, the Lamb's book of life keeps a, a written record, God has a book. He has a record. So he knew everything. By the way, nothing you do surprises him. You can't surprise God. He already knew it. He knew it before you thought of doing it. That's the point. Continuance, which in continuance were written yaum or periods of time. 
These are moments, days, years, a lifetime. All of those would be encompassed in the word, the thought of a yaum. And what's interesting is it says in this that God's record of a human life is chronological when you see how this verse unfolds. Pretty interesting. It sets forth a principle that God has already recorded each person's entire life record long before that person is conceived in the womb. That's what the implications are. That is staggering. So when does life begin? Well, in essence, it began before the foundations of the world when God knew what that life would be. You see, this makes abortion, even the morning after pill, murder. That's what it makes it. So this, we should always let the Bible end arguments for us. Man likes to argue. Man has philosophies about things. We need to let God's word stand on its own. It doesn't need a whole lot of help. We just need to understand what it's saying. And so when you look at this, you could see that it is saying that God knew David his entire lifetime before he was born. So we're making some progress here. Verses 17 and 18. How precious also were thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they're more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with thee. Now, this ties together something you and I saw earlier in the psalm, where David was saying, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol or in hell, you're there. And we look at that. So how does this answer the question, where can I go from your spirit? How precious are your thought? How great are the sum of them? If I should count them, they're more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Well, God always sees the best in us. What could be? Do you realize that to us, it's a decision? Why? Because we are living in the moment, and it is a decision. You're not being forced to choose one or the other. You make the choice. However, because God is outside time and he knows the end from the beginning, to him it's no mystery what choice you're going to make. You're the one making the choices. He's the one who knows what those choices will be. There, there, is, no, there is no contradiction with that. The contradiction comes in when we try to say, well, this is predestination, therefore you don't have a choice. No, you have a choice, that you have that choice. You decide, do I want to scratch my head? Do I not want to scratch my head? Do I want to use this word or that word? You make those choices. God just knows what they are. The fact is that he could see what you could become, what your potential is as a human being. It must break his heart when we fight him in his plan. Do you realize that? He must become frustrated with that. You and I have the human uh, emotion of frustration. But it breaks his heart when we withdraw ourselves from him. When we say, God, no, not your way, my way. Get away from the, I'm driving the car. No, 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 no. He invited you to be a passenger. Gave you a whole lot of things that you could do. He's the one. But, you know, if you want him to, 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 to get, if you think you could do a better job, he says, you know, more power to you. Maybe, maybe that will teach you that you can't. See, an omniscient God sees the outcome of every path that we take. You and I have all seen those Hollywood productions where they, they have a moment in time and there's five choices that could be made and each choice, you go down the mini story on each one of the choices. God sees what that is. That's our, you know, understanding. But he understands where each path is going to lead. And the paths that usually look the best to us are oftentimes the worst. So he tells us, do this. Walk in my ways. You're going to see this. An omnipotent God. So an omniscient God knows everything. An omnipotent God who could impose his will on us chooses not to. He will never force us to love him. That is something we have to do voluntarily. God will never make you love him. He's not surprised at what you're going to do. And if you insist on going through your life, making him an enemy, 
even in your mortal death, he is going to give you what you've asked for, except what you've asked for is not what you want. But it's too late once that happens. See, an omnipresent God promises never to leave us or forsake us. He's always ready. Do you realize that when David walked in the, in, in the flesh and did some things, we know his story of Bathsheba, of, of murdering Uriah, her husband, of his, not only his adultery, but then trying to cover it up on the national scene, marrying her. But God's always at the ready to forgive. He doesn't relieve a person of natural consequences, but he does forgive. Those are two different things. See, God only desires what's best for him. As we said last week, he loves us so much he can't take his eyes off of us. He loves us that much. We're always on his mind. He always wants what's best. He doesn't want what's second best. But you and I are not omniscient. We don't know everything. And so... You know, it's it's kind of like if you think about having a two-year-old. Would you turn the two-year-old loose in the house with no supervision? Would you set the two-year-old behind the wheel of a car and say, here, you take it for a while? No. No. And we are like that two-year-old in the sense that we don't know. We think we do. You think that two-year-old thinks it's good to pick up a you know, a, a, a rock and pound the cat to see if the cat's, you know, what the cat will do. P probably not good for the cat, not good for the child, not good for anything. But the child doesn't know, it thinks they know. We are so childlike as human beings that we don't take into consideration that the one who made us and the one who sustains us just happens to know a little bit more about what's best for us than we do. And we fight that. We fight that. You see, when we stumble and fall, he picks us up. He puts us back in the race. He doesn't leave us down. He says, okay, well, <laughs> good luck with that. No, he lets us get back in. He's continuously the God of the second chance. He watches us over, uh, over us as we sleep. He's there when we're awake. You see, there's no escaping his presence, even though some of humanity doesn't want him, doesn't want his presence, are militant about that point of view. There's no escape from his notice. But sadly, he's going to give those who reject him wholly and completely what they want, total separation and death. He gives them that. And that is a scary thing. It's scary because we don't know what the facts are about death. If we did, and we had that, a better understanding of that picture, we might have some different conclusions about our lives. Verse 19, surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me before, depart from me therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those who rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, we have a small issue here that we have to tackle because this book was written by Jews to a Jewish people. They were God's chosen people. And what conditions were God's chosen people given possession of the promised land? What happened when they were not complying with those conditions? And this is pretty simple. Well, first of all, God said to Abram, verse 18 of Genesis 15, on the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Remember, he's the God that makes and keeps covenants. He never breaks them. He made a covenant with Abraham saying, Abram before he was Abraham, to your descendants, i.e. the Jews, I have given this land. Notice that it's past tense, I have given, it's done, I did it. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Well, if you look at this little map, that's the mustard colored patch in the center. By the way, Israel never occupied all that land, doesn't today. But God said, this is mine, I give it to you, 
to occupy well. What are the conditions of, of occupying it well? It was given under the condition of obedience to God. You have to follow what God says. Look at this in Deuteronomy 28, verses 8 to 9, and then again in 15. And by the way, you should read the whole chapter. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. And he'll bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Yes, the Lord gave you that land. It's your land. He gave it. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he's sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. You see the if there? If, if, if you keep the commandments. It's conditional. He's going to establish you as a holy people, just as he's sworn to you that he's going to do. But it, it's on the condition of you observing the, the, the commandments of the Lord, walking in his ways. Then skipping ahead to verse 15, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you. And then the rest of the chapter, like another 30 verses, are the listing of all the curses that are going to come upon you. So this was clearly known. This was clearly understood. See, when Israel was disobedient to God, God caused their enemies to triumph and remove them from the land. So David didn't know what was going to happen after he died, other than what God revealed to him. But after Solomon, David's son, the nation divided into northern and southern kingdom. The north went into idolatry. The south, the south a little less idolatry. The north went into a captivity under the Assyrians in 722 B.C. The south never learned the lesson and went into the Babylonian captivity in 606 B.C. They never knew what was going to happen. They didn't know about Persia coming in. They didn't know about Greece and Rome and all the stuff that was to ensue. But consequences for life choices were there. This is an important piece because God not only judges people for their life choices, but judges countries for the life choices that the leadership makes. And, you know, under a democracy where we elect the people, we get the leaders that we deserve and they make the choices that will probably cause great misery to us because we're not paying attention to our obligation and responsibility as a citizen. You know, to whom much is given, much more is required. We have the ability to elect our leaders. And that starts at the local, the smallest localist level. Ultimately, all politics is local. They affect you around your dinner table. So we needed that to then understand this passage. Surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. For they speak against, they, the bloody men, speak against you, God, wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate you? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. So why does David call for the departure of the bloody men? Why are they bloody? This is this was written in King James English, but it's not in the English sense that we use the term bloody. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God, depart from me, therefore ye bloody men. Well, David vents his feelings about those who choose to disobey God, who want to be wicked, even though God has revealed his omnipotence, his omnipresence, and his not omniscience to the world. He's revealed himself to the world through the nation of Israel. You know, when, when God says in, in Romans, he's made it clear through his creation, we should be looking at every child and seeing evidence of God's creation. He knit that child together in the womb and caused the cells to divide. He, that, the child has red hair. The child has curly hair. The child has a, you know, a, 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 a left-handedness or a right. God put that together. And so those who walk in disobedience to that, David's saying he wants nothing to do with these folks. See, God's going to end their mortal life. Surely you will slay the wicked. 
The word slay there is katal. It means to put to death, kill, or cut off. The wicked is the word rasha. It means ungodly sinners who reject God. You see, remember, God said, Jews, all the Jews, you can be in my land and get all these blessings if you obey my statutes. But when you don't, then you're going to get these curses. So if five of you do and 50 of you don't, the five get the blessings, the 50 get the cursing. It's pretty simple. We need to understand that God is a God that has consequence. Bloody men. I want you to look at what's in the rectangle that is just drawn on that inset box. You notice a word not translated. That word is 582. That is the, the uh, Strong's numbering system for that word. And then word 1818. Remember, Hebrew is red, red right to left. So bloody men. That first word, root word, 582, enosh, and the second word, damim. It means mortal is enosh. In fact, mortal was the name given to Enosh, one of the 10 Gentile patriarchs who followed Adam and Eve. And then damim means bloodthirsty men. Those who shed blood without cause, those who kill without cause. They enjoy killing, they hate God. That's a commonality about these folks. And so this, this enosh damim, mortal blood thirsty men, that's why you can say it's mortal, these are humans, and damim, I am is the plural, men, mortal blood thirsty men. That's how you get that term. David was told by God, by the way, that David would not be permitted to build the temple because he had shed too much blood in his lifetime. Well, it's not that he killed the giant, and that didn't disqualify him. He was told to lead armies. He was told to do some of these things by God. No, he caused the death of a number of people through his sin with Bathsheba. He had Uriah killed. He caused the death of his firstborn with Bathsheba because of a consequence. He was a bloody man. He disobeyed God. It didn't fully disqualify him, but there was a consequence. He wasn't allowed to build the temple. He could go ahead and gather the materials, but he wasn't permitted to build the temple. David did not, by the way, enjoy taking people's lives in war. The people whose lives he took attacked him, attacked his country. So this is not, this, this being a bloody person isn't following what God said or self-defense. That's not being a bloody person. The idea that you shouldn't have self-defense, that you shouldn't vigorously defend yourself, that's not murder. It's self-defense. But there were people in his army who did enjoy killing. Remember that that army started out with that group of people that he gathered, the malcontents that he gathered in the cave at Mikpah. And, you know, they, you know, there was a bunch of guys there that were really like, you know, the Rambo kinds. Um, after decades of putting up with these folks, David calls for their removal here in this passage. Even some of these people that whose character is being shown as God hating and wanting to kill people. That's what he's talking about here when he says these bloody men. David asked God to take away. Notice that David, that David isn't asking for them to be killed. David is simply making a statement that, God, you will slay the wicked. You, you promise that everywhere in your word. You're going to do that, oh God. And then depart from me, sewer. Remove from me, take away from me, turn aside from me, withdraw from me these bloody men. I don't want to associate with them at all. You see, we are known by the people we choose to associate with. Why would you want to associate with someone, you know, David of all people who knew that he was disqualified to build the temple because of his bloodthirstiness when he had Uriah killed, is now seeing these other guys that were like that, and he says, I don't even want to associate with them. We need to understand what the Hebrews said. When we see this, it's like, okay, I get that. 
Perfect. All right. Let's now take a look at this other aspect. David hates those who hate God. Is that what a Christian today should do? Is that what it's saying? Well, let's look and see what the word here says. For they, the wicked men, the bloody, the wicked and the bloody men, for they speak against the wickedly. You speak against God and you take God's name in vain. Oh, what's that? We'll talk about that in a second. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those who rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred or complete hatred. I count them my enemies. David has gotten to the point that what he knows God despises, he despises. You see, David has aligned his emotional feelings with where God is, and God looks at this. And yet, by the way, understand, God would immediately forgive any of those should they seek his forgiveness and repent. Understand that. So, in one sense, David's saying, I hate this. I despise this. He's aligning with God. He is aligning with God totally. He what? It, the, he's not asking to do the judgment, by the way. He's saying, God, you do the judgment. You know what? If that person, right before they pass away, like the thief on the cross, repents and recognizes you, welcome to the kingdom. This is what I love about David. You see, David describes these people who speak out maliciously and falsely against God. They profane his name. You know, it's interesting. When you take the Lord's name in vain, you're a Christian. Whose name have you taken? Christ's. Do you take it in vain? Do you take it as an emptiness, as a, you take it as fire insurance so that you don't have to pay the penalty, do you? But then you want to go out and do all the other things that wicked people do. Hmm. David says it's not just the people that are murderers. It's people that speak against maliciously and falsely about God and take his name in vain. See, David loves God. He wants to separate himself from those who practice rebellion against God. That's really what he is looking to do. He wants to separate. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. I don't want anything to do with these people. The word hate is the word sane. It means to regard as a foe or enemy. To even be with them is an odious thing. I love that word. I wish we used it more. Odious, something that is so stinky that makes our nostrils burn. The word grieved is the word coot. It's pronounced like C-O-O-T, coot, to detest or loathe or be disgusted by. I regard as a foe those enemies that speak against you, that take your name in vain. I'm grieved that they, these that grieve you. I'm grieved with those. I am detested by those. I loathe them. I'm disgusted. I want nothing to do with them. You know, it's the sin that David hates. What they do offends him. It's not the people. It's the sin. He is giving us a lesson in the fact that God hates the sin, but not the sinner. God forgives the sinner when the sinner wants God to forgive them. David's stating his alignment with God. That's exactly what he's doing. He's aligning his feelings with God. He's giving us an object lesson. If you and I wanted to enjoy a more victorious life, we have to align ourselves more with God. As we align ourselves with God, we become more Christ-like and we become less Hank-like or Mary-like or Cindy-like or John-like. We become more like the Son of God. That's what. So, so his hatred is connected with him being grieved by what they do against God, not because he's rising up as a bloodthirsty person. Yeah, let's kill him. That's not what he's saying here. 
He leads all judgment to God. See, in verse 19, it says, surely thou, capital T, will slay the wicked. Oh, God, in case we missed who it was, the thou. We can't miss that. That judgment becomes God's alone. God doesn't say, well, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm self-appointed as your ambassador of the sword. I'm going to go do it. No, 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 no. Unless God has specifically, explicitly told you that, you are not his self-appointed. You're, a, you're a, your own self-appointed. Oftentimes, well, why did God raise up some people? Well, he did. And he validated the fact that they were raised up. And you, we can read about a lot of those stories in the Bible. They're there for our learning. We can understand that. Just because we get the idea that God is using us as his hammer, you know, is that the Holy Spirit, Spirit speaking or was that last night's bean burrito? You don't know. You need to look. You need to test it against what God says. All judgment to God. It says it over and over and over again. Judgment is the Lord's. You see, this position has been consistent throughout all dispensations of time. Be grieved by the sin around you, but leave the judgment to God. You know, we read this in the New Testament, Hebrews 10, 30 to 31 says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, said, said the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then the great observation, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Whoa. By the way, he hap happens to be quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35 through 36. That's where that verse comes from. So we know God who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. The Lord's going to take care of it. You don't. Don't put yourself in the seat of God unless he invites you to take that seat. We're making some progress here. So let's look at the next verse here. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Um. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So what is God's response to his people versus those deemed wicked? So God has a plan for folks. What's his response? First of all, understand that this cosmic battle has been going on since the foundation of the world was laid in Genesis 1.1. Some see the fall of Lucifer as described in both Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 in a big passage in both of those chapters as taking place between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. It's called the gap theory. You should read about that, explore that. I'll leave you to come to your own conclusions. The battle was joined by human beings in Genesis 3 when Satan induced Eve to sin. Adam followed her into sin and God announced his remedy in the form of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. That was what his remedy was going to be for this cosmic war. Remember, the fall of Lucifer happened because he had pride in his heart. He wanted to be like God. He wasn't content being the number one leading cherub in all creation. That was his role. He was the worship leader. He was the, the covering cherub, as you'll read in, in Isaiah and Ezekiel. He wasn't happy with that. He wanted more. He said, God, I don't like your decision. I have a better way. Well, isn't that what we do when we want to try to get our own way? When we don't like, God says, thou shalt not do. Well, what about thou shalt not do that we don't understand? We, we struggle with that. We try to rationalize. We come up with all sorts of convoluted thinking. God's word is not designed to be convoluted. It's pretty straightforward. This battle that you and I have been, you and I were not, you, we didn't come and said, uh, God, before you, uh, you conceived me in the womb, I, I think I'd like to opt out of this. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a lover, not a warlike guy. No, 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 no. You were born into this condition. You don't have a choice. So you're either going to be on God's side or Satan's side, or you're going to be fodder. It's your choice. You're told to get into the fight. By the way, you're not asked to go out and come up with your own equipment. God provides that. God provides your own equipment. 
you read Ephesians 6. It's called the spiritual armor that we have. It's his armor, by the way, not ours, but he gives it to us to put on just like he does. Everything. He wants us actively engaged and he equips us to do that. So this battle's been going on for a long, long time. You see, there's two voices, two messages, two choices. Both good and evil are mentioned in Psalm 139. It's not possible for you and I to remain at all neutral. As much as you and I might like to remain neutral, as much as you and I are tired sometimes of the battle, we're only tired when we believe Satan and believe that, you know, all the things that are being thrown into our head and stop and realize that our strength is in the Lord and the Lord's strength is inexhaustible. Therefore, you have unlimited strength at your disposal, but you have to ask the Lord to do that and appropriate that moment by moment. Or you could listen to the other voice. We either align with one voice or we align with another voice. Our choices, by the way, determine our destiny. Do you realize that? Our choices determine our destiny. As human beings, our choices determine what happens to us, our destiny. We can't opt out of the battle. God's in total control. He's used the time as we know it since Adam and Eve to enlarge his family. He is an omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient God. He will do everything that he says he will do because he has done everything he said that he was going to do the way he said he was going to do it. But this battle between the two is what you and I are thrown into, that battle. Verses 23 and 24 are an excellent prayer for Christians. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, let's take a look at what this is saying. First of all, this prayer appeals to all three of those omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent attributes that God sets forth in this psalm. That's the God. He's set the foundation for what those three things mean and why he's calling for God and why he's asking God to search him, to know his heart. Remember, he's all-powerful as the creator and sustainer of all creation. That's who he is. His, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at every moment and sees everything. And he's omniscient. He knows everything and can't be surprised at anything. That's what he's coming, and David is saying, search me, O God. He was not going to ask God to search him if God was not capable of searching him. He knows God is. There's no question. Next, the prayer, ask God to search us and know us, not to abandon us in Satan's territory, but instead lead us into eternity with him. There are consequences for life choices. Those consequences are locked forever once we die our mortal death. We need to understand that. See, David realizes this, and he's asking God to search his heart and his mind. By the way, God will do that. God already knows what's in your heart and knows what's in your mind before that it ever gets there. And so by asking God and enlisting God, David is saying, look, I don't know myself as well as I think I should, or as well as I really should. And so Lord, you search me because I'm going to be self-deceived. My nature as a human being is to be horribly self-deceived. I'm going to be self-deceived. So you do it, Lord, because I can't. If I do it, I'm going to be wrong. Do you realize that God is right all the time? Most of us, most of us consider ourselves wildly successful if we're right only half the time. Our track record is not good. You know, most of us don't do well in making a lot of decisions unless the Lord is in them. When you make a decision on your own, I mean, that is foolhardiness. The see, the godly care about what God says, and they want God to point out anything that's ungodly in their heart and mind. This is a prayer you and I should be praying often. Search me, O oh God, know my heart, 
Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me into the way everlasting. That's where we, you and I should be going to God with in prayer often. The godly, see, they don't care. They ignore him, even though they exist because of them, but they still ignore him. They don't really care. David asked God to lead him in the way everlasting, the Derek Olam, the path of life that is eternal and beyond just physical and mortal existence, instead of the, def the default path, which is the pathway to hell. It's reserved for Satan and his angels. So that's what this psalm says, but we're left with some questions. One of the questions we need to go back to is this question that at, we, we first looked at last time. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell or in Sheol, you're there. Behold, you're there. If I take to the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. You see this issue of hell. Hell is a real place. And there are two hells that are described in Scripture, two of them. In order to understand hell, we have to have a lesson in physics. So let's go back to when we learned a little bit about chemistry and so forth. You know, when we study these things, we realize that atoms make up molecules. Atoms are the smallest element that you can measure the single smallest thing, but all atoms are fungible. That means that they are reusable. These They're reused many, 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 many times over. Let me give you an illustration. I want to introduce you to a real musical guy. This is a modern day composer by the name of Brahms II. And he happens to be walking along, and in his mind, he's composing his next musical piece that he's doing. So get this, he's walking and he's composing, right? One day, however, our musical friend is going to die, and he's going to go in the grave. And now, he's decomposing. The fact is that he's decomposing and all those atoms that made up all of his body, the molecules that made up his body, get used. Why? Because Bossy the cow happens to be grazing over that patch, and that grass that she's eating contains some of those parts of our composer friend. And why, why is that important? Because this week, you're looking for that T-bone steak that was Bossy. You see, these atoms get used over and over and over again. So how does God know how to arrange those things? Well, simple. Actually, he designed us. He designed us to be wonderfully made. How does that work? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 35, and then 42 and 43, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? How does God take that dead body of Hank in the ground and raise him up it looks like Hank, because it is Hank. How does he do that? Well, all atoms are fungible. With what body do they come? So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It dies. It's mortal. It dies. It's decomposing. It's raised incorruptible. It doesn't go through that process of dying. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory, it's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. So the resurrection, how does God bring us back after we're that composer who decomposes in the ground, the cow eats the grass that came up, and then we eat the stick? Where's that atom that was part of that person? All atoms are fungible. You see, one of the great discoveries of the last 50 years is that of a digital code that's associated with the composition of most things, including living bodies. You and I know this as a, something called DNA. A human being's physical body is made up of a set of specific chemical compounds with those little atoms in it, governed by a digital code called DNA that governs the specific unique characteristic of that person's body. So you'll look at this diagram that you see on your screen, 
and it's this helix, this double hero, helix, these curved spirally things that, by the way, you see there, they're measured in nanometers. I think that's one billionth of a meter. It's really tiny. You can't see that except if you have a really powerful microscope. But this is how people, you see the people that work in the area of genetics. This is the, the it's all based on this DNA process. Likewise, a human being's memories. So, so if we have the digital code for your body, you could be resurrected. At, even though you died a thousand years ago and all of those atoms have been reused and reused and reused many times, it's a digital code. Pop the digital code. That's why this idea of cloning has scientific merit. It's based on DNA. Well, how about your memories? How about your preferences, your personality? That's called the soul. That's also similarly a digital code. Where does it go? When you die, where does it go? That soul. Interestingly enough, there's really no difference between the weight of human body right before a person's soul departs it than it is after it where you get the differences, the evaporation and release of body fluids and a whole bunch of other icky things like that. But reality of it is, is where it does that go? God says he, that he resurrects us. Whereas, so we know what happens in the body. All you need to do is to reassemble that code, if you will, and boop, up pops Nancy. There she is. Now, what do we do about the soul, the memories and so forth? Well, see, mortal death is defined as the separation of the soul from the body. That's mortal death. That's the first death. All of us are destined to die that unless you happen to be in the rapture generation that the Lord takes up with him. That'd be pretty cool. For the most part, you're going to die. We're all going to die that mortal death. That's the separation of your soul that which is uniquely you, your memories, your personality, preferences, etc., and your body. In fact, the real you is not what you and I look at when we see each other. We actually see the body, the housing of the soul. You're walking around. You're, you're housing. Your housing has degraded. By the way, you're going to get a new housing that's quite an upgrade from what you had. Because the first thing is it never gets sick. It never gets tired. It never dies. It's always in perfect working order. That would be pretty cool, especially as I look around our room here today and realize that some of us are probably feeling a little wee achy on a snowy day like today. So mortal death, separation of the soul from the body. So it, let me give you an analogy, an example, digital code on a DVD, you make a, a, a movie. Well, guess what? This movie is in a studio and it's transmitted. See, right now you and I are transmitting. This, is a, this session is simulcast. Not only are you hearing it in the room, but those of us who are online are hearing it as well. So what is, you know, that, that we can do that. We have the technology today to do that. We can see it. So that music, that stuff that's put on that little piece of plastic, you know, when I take a look at a blank DVD, it has no difference in weight than one that has, it's full of a movie. The weight is identical. Well, when you understand that digital codes have no mass, you now understand something amazing that Einstein and others have proven, that without mass, there is no physical limitation such as time, aging, or gravity. None of those forces affect digital code. That's why if you want to bring that person back from the dead when God raises them from the dead, as we looked at this passage here in 1 Corinthians, the digital code, boop, up is that person. God has the ability to resurrect the body, reunite it at the, with the soul, bring them both together any specific time he wants. Doesn't have to do them at the same time. Remember, he's outside time. As an eternal being, you too will be outside time. You're headed for an upgrade. Remember Jesus' words, John 11, 25, and 26. Jesus said to her, I, 
Jesus and the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Fundamental question we all have to be asked. You see, here's something we need to look at. God put man, took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. That was our first occupation. You were a gardener. First human was a gardener. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you surely shall die. Well, when man ate the tree of knowledge and good and evil, did he die? When did he die? Well, let's look at the record. It, God says you shall surely die. Now, I think that we, if somebody says you shall surely die, I mean, that's pretty direct. Not a lot of confusion there. He's going to die. Well, let's take a look at the Hebrew here. It's up there in the, in the inset. And I want you to pay very uh, close attention to the thou shalt surely word 4191 and die word 4191 just happen to be the same identical word, root word. You see that? They're both the same. Thou shalt die, die. That's what it actually says. The, thou shalt surely, one word, second word, die, is muth, muth. That's the root Hebrew word for that. It's to die the state of death. Said twice, it's a certainty. It's two is the number of witness. Love how scripture is consistent with this stuff. You sure going to die. Why is die stated twice? One death, two deaths, twice for emphasis? Or is it a hint of something deeper, which I happen to think it is? But you need to make your own decision. Genesis 5, 1 to 5 stated that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, and he lived 800 years after. He lived 930 years. So clearly, Seth was born after Adam and Eve sinned. They were childless at that point. He already had the first couple of kids. Things didn't turn out real well. So Seth was number three. But he lived for another 800 years. So he, he physically didn't die, did he? Well, some believe that Adam died spiritually when he sinned against God. Then he died physically at the end of his days at age 930. I would hold to that belief because God said, you shall surely die. Now, he didn't say when and how. He just made as a blanket, powerful fact, you shall surely die. Prior to their sin, by the way, Adam and Eve enjoyed a close relationship with God. There was direct communication between them. They spoke together. They spoke back and forth. They conversed. To me, that suggests that there was a mechanism that enabled that. Well, what happens is when they sinned, they lost that connection. And they got fearful and they hid, making for themselves a covering of fig, fig leaves, realizing something was wrong and they were powerless to do anything to rectify the issue. They didn't eat from the tree of life because that would have given them immortality. You see, you and I need this better understanding of death and what the implications are. So do you realize that there are at least five different kinds of death in the Bible? Death number one is the separation of the soul from the body. Joshua says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Many other places say this person died. Physical death. Spiritual death, separation of the spirit from the soul. Ephesians 2, 1, B, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You can see a bunch of other verses that say that same thing, that dead. Positional death, identifying with the death of Christ as if you had died. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? There are many places where that concept is used. Sexual death, the inability to procreate. Romans 4.19 talks about Abraham and not being weak in faith. He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham died, by the way, at, at age 175. In other words, he was going through a midlife crisis when he said this. We do crazy things at midlife crises, don't we? Well, we could follow Abraham there. And finally, the second death. This is said of unbelievers following the great white throne judgment. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You should read around that passage and get a better understanding of it. So 
in preparation for next week, and this is where we will pick it up next week, is you need to read Luke 16. You're going to need to read Luke 16. And Luke 16 is going to give you not a parable, but a story of actual people, real people, because parables use as and like, and they're a structure that doesn't talk about real people. And then you say, well, guys, the rich man and Lazarus, only one has a name. Yeah, there's a reason for that. You earn a name. When your name is not stated, it's because of what you chose to do during your life. And the name is blotted out. So we're going to look at that next week, next time we meet here in Luke 16. Please take the time to prepare for it. It is an amazing passage. We're going to deconstruct that and a whole bunch of other things. Again, an exciting study. So um, let's uh, close in prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the incredible word that you've given us. We thank you for the power that it is. We thank you for the understanding that you give us with your word and how you tell us things in your word that we would otherwise miss. And yet, Father, we thank you for those faithful studiers and scholars who went before us to help us to understand your word by the translation and um, how you use language to communicate your thoughts to us. We thank you for these things. Father, help us, first of all, to recognize that in our own sinful state, in our own very limited state, we do not know what is best for us. So we pray, search our hearts, Father. Help us to see the wicked ways in us. We know, Lord, that obeying you is what you desire for each of us. That pleases you. So, Father, encourage us this week to be obedient to you. Help us to see in your word, and as we prepare for next uh, week in studying Luke 16, help us to see the truth there in that story. We thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you would never leave us alone, that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. You gave us the Holy Spirit to be our comforter and our instructor. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. We praise you and glorify you in the precious name of your Son, Christ Jesus, for he is our living and risen Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.